So hey guys and welcome to another short, uh, I guess you could call it an adventure game, it's more of an interactive story to be honest, it's called That Old Time Religion, uh, based inside the game world of something called Deadlands Noir, which is like a kind of pen and paper RPG system, uh, set in kind of a an alternate history if you like, that kind of merges uh, kind of, you know, private eye crime story with some horror elements. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of an interactive story, kind of a choose-your-own-adventure-esque sort of thing, uh, which means there's not a lot of action involved, but it may be quite an interesting story. So let's get started and let's see what we're doing in this story. From what I understand, we're a private detective who's been employed to deal with some strange goings-on. Let's find out what it's all about. Tips. The story is set to automatically progress to the next page after a few seconds. I can adjust the text speed and the preferences to speed it up or slow it down. I can auto. We'll disable the auto forward. Uh, do we want tips? I can return to a previously read section by using the mouse wheel to scroll up and back. Okay, well, let's just start. Episode 1 is the politics of religion. And I guess that's where we should start. We're in Harvey's office. A priest, a rabbi, and a hoongun walk through the door, so we got a pre- Does that, that sounds like the start of a joke, yeah? No, it wasn't the start of a joke, of a joke. I really wish it was. It was instead the start of a couple of really bad days. Mr. Harvey Jenkins, yes? That was the priest, a small, portly man in the usual black slacks and shirt, with that white square for a collar that's the usual dead giveaway. He looked as nervous as a rabbit at a coyote convention, eyeing me in much of the decor of my ramshackle office with barely concealed discomfort. I couldn't really blame him, I looked like a hundred miles of bad road on the best of days. My last three cleaning ladies all quit after less than a week each on the job. And there are things in my office even I don't like to look at if I can help it. The rabbi was less nervous by far, in fact, he looked entirely amused. You certainly fit the descriptions we've been given, Mr. Jenkins. To a T, I might add. I instantly liked this guy. He was burly, but had the build of someone who'd worked hard most of his life and knew how the world worked. He just had a way of putting folks at ease, which was probably a good thing if you're going to be Jewish in the Deep South. Mama Bonte, she don't lie. I told you she knew this man. She knows him and she knows he's the right one for us to call on. I was wearing a rather dapper grey suit with a matching fedora. And though it was clear he didn't need it for his lean, athletic frame, he had a black cane with a silver head of some kind of lizard on it. With eyes almost as black as his skin, he studied me hard and I shifted under his gaze. Something I could do for you gentlemen, or are you here to take turns trying to save my sorry soul? Each of the men chuckled at that, even the priest, though the Hoongan never took his eyes off me. The other two seemed to be waiting on him, so the room got quiet as we all looked at him. Finally, he grunted with some semblance of satisfaction. Yeah, he's the one. He's been touched by something, and it marked him. But he got a strong soul and a good heart, so he's the one. Gentlemen, I'm sure this all means something to you, but the only reason I've not been inclined to toss you collectively out in your keisters is because I don't tend to like to get on the wrong side of the clergy, and Lizard Kane here had the good sense to mention Mama Bonte, who we owe a couple of favours to. Still, you're cutting into some prime drinking time here, so if there's a point... More grins, and the rabbi laughed congenially as he plopped down in the chair right in front of my desk. The Hungan grabbed a stool nearby, and the priest went over and sat gingerly down on the couch. I normally use for a bed when I'm too tired or drunk, usually both, to trudge home to my apartment. I figured it best not to tell him how much blood and booze had been soaked in by those cushions. It didn't look like he needed any more reasons to be nervous. I'm Rabbi Koch, but you can just call me Saul. My esteemed colleagues are Bishop Brian McClarty and Daddy Thunderhand, one of the Hoongan Sogways of New Orleans. I was a bit thrown by the introductions and had heard of all three of these men. Rabbi Saul Koch was the leader of the largest Jewish temple in the Greater New Orleans area, while Bishop Brian McClarty was one of the movers and shakers of the city's Catholic community. As for Daddy Thunderhand, there were few in New Orleans, New Orleans who didn't know of the man who could make it rain and call his faithful to war if he so chose. Most of the police department was orders, on orders to just leave him alone, unless they directly witnessed him murdering someone. Just what were three of the most powerful religious leaders of New Orleans and the surrounding parishes doing in my humble office? I was pretty sure I wasn't going to like the answer. 
I hate being right about such things. Harvey, may I call you Harvey? I nodded at the disarming rabbi. What we have here is a very difficult situation, one that promises to make a lot of trouble for a lot of good people if we don't take action. You see, there's a reason three gents like us can get along well enough to come see you all at once like this. Heck, we even get together and play cards over good wine and nosh, talk theology without coming to blows and genuinely like each other. Saul beamed at both of the others who smiled affably enough back to let him know... Wait, at him. To let me know he wasn't just throwing a line. Thing is, it wasn't always like this. You gotta expect that religious divides can be hard to overcome and they can make for some ugly relations for the folks who believe so differently. Poor Brian's predecessors were constantly having to beat the parishioners over the head and shoulders with the New Testament, trying to keep them from heading over to the voodoo parts of the city and setting fires. Which would have been a bad move since that means daddy's folks would have fought back with god knows what and turned the whole city into an abattoir. Naturally, my people would have just been crushed in the crossfire. Emma's didn't side with the Catholics in the first place. Do you know why none of this has come to pass, Harvey? Why we haven't had nasty little religious wars in one of the most vulnerable cities in this part of the world? I'd have to say, Saul, that I haven't given it much thought. I guess maybe I should have, but... I shrugged, took another sip of bourbon. I almost offered Bishop McClarty a swig as he looked like he needed it. Instead, I passed the ball to Daddy Thunderhand, who smiled and accepted. Then the bishop spoke up. Mr. Jenkins, it's well that you don't concern yourself with such matters normally. That is, in fact, a testament to the man we've come to ask for help in finding. He's the reason our communities are at peace with each other, and why we're even able to come together in times of crisis and work as a single community when the need arises. Daddy Thunderhand chimed in. Surely you notice there's one man missing here, yeah? Took me another minute, but it finally hit me. There ought to be a Baptist here. I'd guess that would be the good Reverend Kellerman. They all smiled at that, and Bishop Bryan went on, actually seeming to relax a bit as he did. Indeed, Mr. Jenkins, it would seem our collective hopes that you would be quick on the uptake are well-founded. Reverend Paul Kellerman is the man most responsible for the relative harmony New Orleans enjoys from its spiritual communities. He preaches a message that is big on love thy neighbour and judge not lest ye be judged, and he does so with great charisma and leadership. In short, it's all about in. He's kept the peace among us for over 20 years. Now he's missing, and we're all more than a little worried, because it's pretty clear there's been foul play, and we think it's beyond the ability of the police to handle. They ain't got nobody who can handle the powers we think are at work here. The whole city's starting to go dark already, with demons and shadows playing on the edges like they're waiting for something to start. Hengen said all of this as though it were perfectly normal and not at all like something out of the cheap pulp novel. Trouble was, I knew he was only too right about what really lived in the shadows. I'd already been chewed up and spit out by a few ugly beasts from beyond in my time here. That was, in fact, part of why I owed Mama Bonte a couple of favours. So you gentlemen want to hire me to find Reverend Kellerman. And when I say hire, I hope you realise that a good heart and owing Mama Bonte favours doesn't help pay the rent on this office, or put more bourbon on the shelf, so... Another hearty laugh from Saul brought a return grin from me. Not to worry, Harvey. We'll be paying you top rates, plus expenses, and a bonus you can take a vacation with if you find Paul. There's plenty of wealthy and powerful folks who support our cause to keep the peace in New Orleans, so the funds are there. In fact, he reached in his pocket, pulled out a cheque, and slid it across the desk at me. That's when I knew I was in trouble. It was the biggest retainer cheque I'd ever received. The three gentlemen pointed me in three different directions after which they left to tend to their flocks and see what they could do about the supernatural threats they each perceived. Bishop McClarty encouraged me to start with the scene of the crime itself, which was Reverend Kellerman's office at the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church, one of the oldest churches in the city. He told me to look up the church secretary, a Miss Mary Carmichael. Saul thought I should go and see the Reverend's daughter, Rachel. He seemed pretty adamant about it, and he warned me that she was already being guarded by the police against possible kidnapping. Daddy Thunderhand recommended I look into the dealings of one Gospel Devino, a.k.a. Brother Gospel Divine. A newcomer to the Big Easy, he'd been setting up a huge tent revival out on the edges of the city. That's like where they set up like a big tent as a church, basically, I think. Preaching about cleaning the sin out of New Orleans. He didn't get done that, didn't do that, did he? If you want. <laughs> the other two weren't so sure, but the Hoongans seemed convinced the coming troubles were somehow linked to him. Not that, not that the sin is necessarily a bad thing. 
The streets of Nola are full of wise and sharp-eyed folks. And with the right word here, the right amount of money there, a man can find out almost anything. Yeah, but you've got to clear the check first, right? If he doesn't find a bullet or a knife in his back first. So I think we're going to check out the church first. Just something about blondes. Mary Carmichael had that peaches and cream complexion you hear women going on and on about. Long, wavy hair that flowed around her face as she bent down over her desk looking at some paperwork. A figure that went a few degrees shy of plump in every perfect way you might hope to find in a farmer's daughter on a cold and rainy night out in the middle of the sticks. Well, okay. <laughs> this was not the kind of woman I expected to be working as a church secretary, but I always welcome pleasant surprises. My life was entirely too full of the other kind these days. I'm sorry, Mr. Jenkins, but the last appointment I have on record for the Reverend was with his daughter, Rachel. She was supposed to meet him at 7.30 here to discuss some matters of their estate. Then they were to go out to dinner. It was well past my normal quitting time, so I wasn't here when... She paused, and tears started to well up in her robin egg blue eyes as she looked at me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just can't imagine why anyone would do this to him. He's such a kind and giving man, so full of the spirit of the Lord. She fingered her rather ostentatious, ostentatious, gold and diamond cross with worry. I moved past her and into Kellerman's inner office, which was an absolute wreck. The two flatfoots who'd let me into the place were hovering over by the other door, mostly enjoying the view of Mary Carmichael. Neither had the look of future detectives about them. I looked around at the scene and I immediately figured a few things out. Someone either wanted to make this look particularly violent, or just really didn't care what got messed up when they came for Paul Kellerman. Despite the mess, though, there was no sign of blood. Either someone did a fine clean-up job, or the preacher didn't put out much of a fight. The place had been dusted for prints, of course, but as many folks as came and went through here, that didn't seem likely to turn up much. As I continued slowly wandering around his office, I asked Miss Mary, did the Reverend, Reverend have any enemies, ma'am? Was he in any kind of feud or quarrel you know about? I tell you, Mr. Jenkins, Paul was one with the Lord. He truly loved all of his brothers and sisters in Christ. I began to get the feeling from the look in her eyes as she talked about him that perhaps she'd wanted to know more of that love than most. From what I'd heard, however, the man had been utterly faithful to his wife, even after she died. Even so, Miss Carmichael, men like the Reverend can stir up people who don't nece necessarily believe in what he does, right? I gave her a steady, reassuring gaze, wanting her to believe I really was here to help. Apparently I passed some kind of test, because she glanced nervously at the two donut eaters, before making her way conspiratorially over to me. In a much quieter voice, she said, Well... Now, he did have some real concerns about that new fellow with the tent revival that recently arrived in town. The one they call Brother Gospel Divine? The very one, Mr. Jenkins. Their one and only meeting did not go well at all, I'm sad to say. Brother Divine seemed to think that the Reverend's overly tolerant nature towards the other religious groups was a sure sign that the apocalypse would begin right here in New Orleans. I mean, the very idea. She looked genuinely outraged, clearly remembering the incident. This dame had it bad for the Reverend. That was for certain. Is there anything else you can think of, ma'am? Anything at all? Well, I don't like to start rumours, Mr. Jenkins. Mary, his life is clearly in danger. They're not rumours if they're clues I can use to save him. She seemed to grasp that. Her eyes got wide, then narrow. Well, Mr. Jenkins, it's just that I kept noticing how that gospel divine and Paul's daughter Rachel kept looking at each other. It seemed pretty certain to me that they knew each other from somewhere, and there was a lot more going on there than the Reverend knew. I meant to warn him, but it's just not that easy to bring a thing like that up. You understand? I nodded. Thank you, Miss Carmichael. You've been very helpful. Just as I turned to leave, I noticed two coffee mugs on the desk. One, which seemed likely to be the Reverend's from where it was laying on its side, had a strange stain in the bottom. I grabbed it, took a sniff, and then scraped out some residue and put it into a small metal vial I kept for such occasions. The other, mostly still full of coffee, had lipstick on it. I took the stuff I scraped out of the Reverend's mug over to a friend of mine's shop, Doc Carver's got all the science learning I could ask for. Unfortunately, he'd got around to forgiving me for the last time I'd involved him in a case. He checked it out, and sure enough, my hunch was right. Poison. The kind that puts a man out for hours. Time to look into other matters. Let's go see his daughter. Could it be that his daughter poisoned him? Was it about preacher's kids that always puts them in the middle of the worst kinds of trouble? Yeah, I know, a pretty dumb question to ask. Truth to tell, Rachel Kellerman was the least like the stereotype I'd ever met. Her brown hair was perfectly quaffed in the latest fashion, and her clothing, while not quite society elite, was certainly of a style and cut that spoke volumes about the circles she was used to travelling in. 
She exuded class and poise with just the right mix of prim and proper presence and an undertone of pure sex. Then again, maybe she was more of a preacher's daughter than I figured on first blush. We met in the sitting room of her very fine townhome with a pot of tea steeping and tasty little cakes at hand. I had to pass through two solid looking uniforms to get through the front door and it was only because Rabbi Saul Koch asked the mayor personally to have the police cooperate with me that I made it this far. There were two more bright and shiny young cops in the back and a patrol car made a regular pass around the neighbourhood. Apparently the city was taking the reverend's kidnapping pretty seriously. Sitting with us in the nice little room was a lump of tan slacks and white rumpled shirt named Hal Blake. He was nervously playing with an unlit cigar, sticking it in his mouth one minute, fidgeting with it the next. Clearly Miss Rachel Kellerman wasn't having any smoking in her fine place, which was fine by me. Anything that made Hal Blake unhappy made my day just a little bit better. Hal was an ex-cop in the way a guy least wants to be. Fired for being on the take. He was accepting bribes from competing crime gangs and it was making his bosses look bad. Blake went from a disgraceful police career to a fairly dismal PI business. He did have the one advantage of being a really good shot and having a pretty fair rep as a bodyguard, which was how he was making his rent most days. Hal and I got along mainly by avoiding each other like bad diseases, which of course wasn't working out very well today. I chose to ignore him. He chose to glare at me. So, you say you didn't see your father at all the day he disappeared, is that right, Miss Kellerman? She leaned forward to start fixing herself a cup of tea, letting her blouse open just enough to hint at the rather exquisite décolletage she made such efforts to barely conceal. Mr Jenkins, I've certainly regaled all of these facts to the police detectives to great exhaustion. Surely you can just read the reports they've taken. Her genteel southern accent absolutely flowed like honey from her ruby lips, and there was no mistaking the subtle sense of mere toleration my intrusion in her manner. Nonetheless, she was the perfect hostess, also pouring me a cup of tea, and with raised eyebrow and a mere nod, figuring out how I liked it. As with all things, straight was fine with me. She then set a tiny little cake on the same saucer as the tea and handed it to me with absolute grace and a fine smile. She didn't offer Hal anything. I just couldn't help myself. I tasted the cake and made a satisfied face, then took a sip of the tea and got poisoned. I hate tea, utterly. I hated Hal more, and the extra heat in his glare made the swill worth swallowing. I set down my saucer and cup. Ma'am, I just want to be sure, since there's some evidence to suggest that someone was there in the office enjoying a cup of coffee with him at the time he was taken. There, that was the moment. Hal's constant fidgeting with the cigar paused, and there was a flicker in her eyes. I'd been at this too long to miss such things, which is part of why I make any money at this job. Of course, it's also the kind of thing that's likely to get me killed. Perhaps even today. Mr. Jenkins, she went on, decidedly cooler in her tone. I'm not quite sure I understand what you're implying. My daddy loved Mama with every bit of his soul, and I'm certain he hasn't so much as thought of another woman in the year and a half since her passing. Well, I'm not saying he was doing anything with them, but he was certainly having a cup of coffee. Hal was fidgeting, but not glaring. I consider this a clue, I'm a real pro that way. Miss Kellerman, I mean, don't, no disrespect, I'm just trying to help find your father. Same as the police. Hal finally spoke up even though Rachel made no indication she wanted him to. He apparently didn't make a very good trained goon. Geez, Harvey, you not get a look at that blonde at the church? Got to figure she might have a cup of joe with the preacher every once in a while, yeah? Rachel glanced ever so casually at Hal, then nodded and smiled at me. Yes, I'm sure that's it. Mary's very loyal and friendly to Daddy, and I'm sure it's nothing more sinister than that. Pointing out that I'd already determined she was nowhere around at the time of the kidnapping, as well as the fact that the shade of lipstick that had been on the coffee cup matched Rachel's perfectly, didn't seem the wisest move just now. Instead, I just smiled, stood up and nodded respectfully. No worries, Miss Kellerman, I'm sure you're right. Sorry to have bothered you, have a fine day. I think she probably agrees with this guy that's got the tent revival. I put on my hat and showed myself to the front of the house. Hal Blake followed me none too subtly. Why don't you go find some cheating creeps to peep on, Harv? This one's out of your ballpark. Better than bringing a football like you to a baseball game, Blake. It wasn't good, but it was all I had since I was plenty distracted. I'd caught a glimpse of a stack of mail that someone had nudged up against on the way past the little table next to the front door. I'd always had sharp eyes. The day I couldn't see so great anymore would be the day for me to buy a fishing boat and make for the Florida Keys. There'd been one piece of mail I thought very telling, and I meant to find out what it was, telling me it was directly addressed, in flowing script, to one Rachel Kellerman. The return address, also handwritten, featured one Gospel Devono. 
As I made my way down the sidewalk, I spotted two pieces of walking granite matching my pace across the street. Crosses on their heads. Black suits. Black shirts. No ties. A nasty X branded on their foreheads. I was just starting to think about which alley to duck down when two more stepped out right in front of me. One pointed and shouted, even as the first two broke into a run towards me. We've come to bear witness! Uh, uh, go for the high ground. Odds are rarely in my favour whenever I find myself in a fight. What few friends I have in this world tell me it's karma or the sins of my past. I think it's just the nature of my business, a lone investigator snooping into the business of powerful people who can afford to hire groups of folks to beat the crap out of me. I could run, but that wouldn't tell me much about these guys, and I had a feeling I needed to know just what I was dealing with. A stand-up fight wasn't a good idea either. I've been known to handle myself well in more than a few one-on-one -on -one brawls, but it takes a special kind of stupid to think you can go the distance with four sides of beef at once, even if you have some heat. Besides, I didn't like shooting anyone if I didn't have to. The paperwork's a real pain in the ass. Doc Carver was in the big one, and he always talks about taking the high ground when things get dangerous. It seemed like a solid plan this time, so I dove into the alleyway the two new arrivals had just left and made for the nearest fire escape. After a bit of jostling with each other, the four monsters made their way after me, reaching up even as I was pulling myself to the nearest landing. So far so good, but I was starting to think I needed to elaborate on my plan a bit. After all, once we got to the top, I was pretty much the same story, only now they had gravity to play with when they got their hands on me. Gravity, see Doc? I do pay attention sometimes when you start spouting all that science stuff. Instead of making my way up to the ladder to the second landing, I grabbed the underside of it and braced myself as the first big man made his way near the top and started reaching for me. He was just starting to shout, We shall bear witness at me again, when I firmly planted both feet square in his pie hole. Teeth shattered and he lost his grip, plummeting back down the ladder and taking his three friends down with him. I slid like a fireman down the ladder after them. The one I kicked was already out, and the one right behind him was nearly down for the count. The other two were scrambling to their feet, but I had managed to grab a brick on the ground and clocked both of them before they got their bearings. I was pretty upset by the fact that I had to hit each of them twice to make it stick. I popped the nearly down one in the back of the head with the now busted brick, then paused to let the shock of the fight wear off a bit while I looked to see if there was any more trouble coming. Once I was satisfied things were done for the moment, I checked out my playmates. Each of them was wearing some kind of really odd medallion around his neck. It was an iron circle with some kind of weird lines on it. I think I'd heard things like this called runes once or twice. I went ahead and took all four, then made my way out the alley. The last thing I needed was some wandering patrolman deciding he needed to run me in for questioning. Uh, better things to do. Uh, Mama Bonte will have some more to tell. Let's do that. You got yourself in a mess again, child. Cocoa skin and a smooth and silk voice with that Creole spice made my spine tingle every time. Mama Bonte and I had something. There was no point in defining it or making it more than it was. We simply understood each other as a part of the city most folks don't even want to think about. And we helped each other as best we could. There are worse ways to conduct a relationship. I think I can blame you a bit for this one, sweetness. I gave her a challenge and look, she just laughed. Fair enough, Mr Jenkins, fair enough. You've been tough to kill, gonna probably be helpful this time round too. There's bad mojo at work, no mistake. That gospel divine don't be bringing the Lord to New Orleans, he be bringing the devil, and it ain't gonna, and it's gonna get real ugly real soon if you don't figure out how to deal with him. I don't suppose you got any ideas about that, do you? I really hated dealing with magic and monsters, and yet it seemed I was somehow linked to them every time I turned around. I was pretty sure I had my grandfather to blame for that. Me and Daddy Thunderhand been looking into it, you get me something I can work with, I may be able to help you. A man like gospel, he's got to be messing with powers he doesn't quite understand, and that usually means talismans and such. Get me something like that, and I think I can work you up a way to handle things. Maybe. Well, we got some talismans. Didn't like the word maybe, especially not when my continued breathing hang on it. Let's show the uh, medallions. Well now, Mr. Jenkins. These are really interesting. Talismans, they are. Somebody's using them to make men into something else. Something strong, tough, and very loyal to whoever's working the mojo. Mama Bonte was studying the trinkets I brought her very carefully, and it was clear she was more than a little concerned about what she was seeing. In fact, she looked downright angry. This is like some very bad black magic I've seen more than once. Harvey, very bad. Make a person into a thing. Take away their light forever. Even after you take this off them, they aren't ever going to be the same again. A ghost of what they were, with no hope and no path. Most of them will just find a way to, the e to end their life, because they can't see light without the one who made them like this in the first place. I grimaced at that. I'd left those guys to wake up and just go look for a way to die. 
Still not a whole lot I could do about that now. So how do I deal with this, man? How do I fight this kind of monster? She looked at me and a moment of real concern passed through those deep black eyes. Harvey, you try not to deal with them. You can help it. I started to protest and she held up a hand. But I know you and me. And you're going to finish what you started. Keep one of these, it might help. You get into anything with some of them again. Meantime, I look into what I can do to give you something stronger. Gonna need time though, so try not to get killed before I get done. That was fine advice by me. I was rather fond of not getting killed at all, frankly. I died once, it wasn't a habit I wanted to get into. Alright, well. It's time to go to the Gospel Divine then, right? I made my way out past the city limits, where some farmer had given up a huge part of his fields for the circus that Gospel Devino had brought in. A huge, colourful sign hung over the whole mess, reading, The Gospel Divine, Revelations and Redemption Revival, All Sinners Welcome. It was nice to feel like I was invited. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of folks were busy with any number of tasks or milling about and talking with each other like they were at a church social, which I suppose was pretty much the case. There was one huge, big top style tent in the middle of the gathering with smaller tents, trailers and temporary buildings sprung up like mushrooms in a cow pasture. That was apropos since we were actually in a cow pasture to start with. Two things caught my attention right away. The first was how the big tent was clearly being guarded at all entrances, and it looked like only a very select few were allowed in or out. Folks dressed far better than the average hanger-on seemed like they had some kind of authority or special role in things. Anyone else who got too curious about what was beyond the flaps was rather forcefully pushed back by the guards. That was the other thing that got my attention, the guards. All of them were huge men dressed in black suits with black shirts, no ties, and they all had an X branded right on their foreheads. As the horror of that particular creepy bit of business settled in, a dapper gentleman picked his way through the mud and manure towards me, carefully stepping on the straw that had been hastily strewn about to cover most of the mire. Greetings, pilgrim. I'm Brother James. Have you come to wash away your sins and become a part of our movement? I tried to smile, though the look of the guards weighed heavily on me. His slightly smarmy nature didn't actually do a lot for my disposition, either. Brother James, while I appreciate your concern for my soul, I doubt you've got enough water or wine out here to wash away all of my sins. Actually, I'm here to see if I can talk to Mr. Gospel Devino. Brother James' expression didn't change one iota, his smile still perfectly planted on his face. Nonetheless, I got the distinct impression that he'd already decided he didn't like me. Well, that's fine, we don't like him. That was fine, most people don't like me when they first meet me. People tend to like me even less after they get to know me. Many wish to seek the blessed wisdom of Brother Gospel Divine, sir. Tries to reach out to all, but I'm sure you can understand he's a very busy, very involved man. He'll preach tonight, as always, if you join us for the nightly service. I'm certain his words of inspiration and guidance will reach you, brother. It was clear Brother James was fishing for a name, though I had no inclination to add him to my family tree as a brother. I obliged him. After all, it's the polite thing to do when you're snooping into a man's business. Jenkins, Harvey Jenkins. Produced my credentials. Private investigator. This time, Brother James' expression did change. The smile slightly faded, and he was clearly moving into a defensive frame of mind. They all do when they see the badge. I'm quite certain, Mr. Jenkins, that I have no idea what this is about, but I can assure you we have all the necessary permits and licenses. Well, a private detective isn't going to pull you for permits, is he? While a number of folks have claimed some concern for family members who've joined us, no one's here unless they wish to be. There are a few esteemed members of law enforcement, and local government even, who are among our ranks. There are no irregularities for you to investigate. He said that last word with a certain amount of disdain. Like most people say the word, fornicate. I put on my pleasant, patient face. It doesn't look too different from my usual face, except that it makes me look a little less like I'm about to punch or shoot you. James, I'm sure all that's fine. I'd just like to ask the good brother Divine a couple of questions. Regarding? Oh, here he is. This didn't come from persnickety brother James, but from a golden, powerful voice behind him. We both turned to see a man in a pure white suit, with a white shirt and white tie. He had on a white fedora and carried a silver cane with a golden cross on top. Is he going to South America soon, is he, to usurp a load of local people? He had on a white fedora, yeah. He was flanked by two of those huge, branded men with a lovely scarlet-haired lady carrying a notebook next to him. Her black skirt was hip-hugging and just barely decent in length. Barely. He strode up confidently and every single pair of eyes in the area was on him. Looks of adoration came from most, save a few who spared me looks of far less than that. He seemed incapable of getting any mud or muck on his pristine suit. I'd have paid good money for that ability. 
Brother James leaped into explanation. Brother Divine, you've no need to concern yourself with this matter. I assure you this is just another one of those PIs some non-believer has hired to try and convince a loved one to abandon our cause. Gospel Divine wasn't a large man. In fact, he was a bit on the short side and skinny to boot. Yet his presence was formidable. So handsome, he was practically pretty and oozing charisma out of every pore. If I hadn't already faced down things from the pit of hell a few times, I might have been actually impressed. He appraised me carefully as he spoke. Is that true, sir? You're here to try and convince a member of my flock to leave us? I looked him straight in the eyes. I got the impression he wasn't used to that. I couldn't tell if he liked or hated it. No, sir, nothing like that. I'm just here to ask you a few questions about the disappearance of Reverend Paul Kellerman. There. So often it comes down to just saying the right thing at the right time. If you know what to watch for, and any PI who wants to make a living at this figures this out, it comes down to the reaction to your words in that one moment. Divine was good, I had to give him that. Nothing, not a twitch, not a tell of any kind. I might as well have said I just came for a cheeseburger and some fries, took a wrong turn for all the reaction I got in the moment. No, it was Brother James and the redhead who gave it away. She focused just a little too intently on her notebook, and James's eyes narrowed just for an instant before he caught himself. Just like a really intense game of poker between two sharks, Gospel Divine and I both knew what had happened. I had him and I knew it. He was a pro though, and the game still had to play out. Yes, I'd heard about that poor man being kidnapped the other night. Well, did anyone say he'd been kidnapped? He and I might not see eye to eye on matters of the spirit, Mr. Jenkins, but I still consider any harm brought to a brother in Christ to be a terrible tragedy. If you're looking into his disappearance, I'm grateful. I am, however, unclear on how I might be of help here. Time to play my trump. Well, sir, considering you and his daughter have some kind of relationship, I was rather hoping you might have had some dealing with the Kellermans lately and could help me get a sense of who might have had it in for him. A slight smile played at one corner of his mouth. He was actually enjoying this. Ah, Miss Rachel Kellerman. Yes, she and I have had a correspondence. Though I consider it to be of a private nature, I'll reveal to you that she and I have a certain level of agreement where her father's overly tolerant nature is concerned. There's a surprise. I've been hoping to meet her in person while here, but we've not managed that just yet. I'm sorry, but if that's all, I'm afraid I have a service to prepare for. Realising that I'd gotten what I'd come for, I decided it might be time for a tactical withdrawal. After all, I really didn't like how those giants with the branded foreheads were looking at me. Honestly, Mr. Devineau, please, Mr. Jenkins, call me divine. Fat chance. Sorry, I just felt like such a large congregation of spiritual folks might have some helpful information. I can see you're very busy, so I'll let you back to your work. I handed the redhead my card. I was pretty sure no one ever handed gospel divine anything directly. If you do come across any information, I'll be grateful to hear from you. I turned to go at that, figuring this part of the game was over. I'm guessing I figured wrong. Not quite. Mr. Jenkins? His voice rang like a bell, and I couldn't help but stop in my tracks and turn to face him again. He strode very purposefully towards me, and I was shocked to see that even his bodyguards held back. Brother James was already on his way to instruct others in one task or another, and though it was clear that the leader had one more thing to say to me, most folks seemed to be inclined to stay out of business that didn't concern them. The glares of the bodyguards seemed to help in that. Devineau caught up to me, and he stood close enough to speak at a near whisper. You've been touched, Mr. Jenkins. Touched by shadows, by darkness. We both know it. He looked at me intently, obviously expecting some kind of response. I didn't oblige him. He went on. My ministry could use one with your gifts and your experience, sir. I promise you the rewards would be most... He glanced back at the redhead who was looking nervously our way. Fulfilling. I can also promise you that anything that interferes with the ministry runs the very real risk of facing terrible wrath. That's a threat, right? God's will must be done, Mr. Jenkins. It must be done. I just stared at him for a long moment. I could have gone the, the usual, is that a threat route? But again, we both knew the game well enough to avoid the cliché. Of course, it was a threat. He'd made his play to recruit me. Now it was my turn. I know a handful of folks who feel pretty particular about God's will, Mr. Devineau, and I'm pretty sure they don't agree with you on just what that means. Then I smiled, turned, and walked away from him, saying over my shoulder, and I'm pretty sure you don't buy the crap you're selling either. Where should you investigate? Well, the only thing left to do is hit the streets. There are plenty of fine, safe places in New Orleans. The kinds of places folks go to have a nice dinner, hear some great music, and enjoy the beauty of the city. Those aren't the kinds of places I go on days like this. Seedy dive bars, old dock signs with rotted wood and rotted fish, back alleyways that get the wrong people robbed or dead. These are the places I wander when I need to get a feel for what's happening in this city. These are the places I haunt, like a grey-suited ghost. Fortunately, Rabbi Koch's check was good, and I had plenty of green to spread where I needed to. I soon figured out a few interesting things. For one, the streets were a lot less crowded with bums and the down and out. 
Seems like Gospel Divine's Revival was offering food, work and more to anyone who wanted to come out, hear the word and pitch in. Desperate folks can find an awful lot of religion in their bones when there's a hot bowl of soup and a couple of dollars in it for them. What disturbed me more by far were the tales of very large men in black suits, black shirts with no ties and strange brands on their foreheads. Apparently they never spoke, instead just standing around and watching other folks intently. From what I could put together they seemed mostly focused on folks who'd gone to see Gospel Divine, but didn't sign on to his cause or donate any money. When the local constables got around to asking some of these gorillas about their business, apparently the only thing they said was, we're here to bear witness. This was sounding more and more like a confidence game with a shakedown element. I was hoping that was all it was, but a man doesn't easily take a brand on his forehead just to scare money out of folks. I was beginning to think these witnesses were going to be real trouble. Where next? I think it's time to pay another visit to Rachel Kellerman. Didn't look like I was going to get my second interview with Rachel Kellerman. The front door was busted wide open, half off the hinges. The two uniforms were lying dead on the stoop. One's neck was broken, the other's face was smashed in. I could still smell the gunpowder, they'd gotten shots off. Apparently it hadn't mattered much. I pulled my 38 anyway, went inside Rachel's place, looking down the hall. I could see the wide open back door where the other two cops were also mangled up. The whole place was a trashed mess and the power was out. I lit a candle and started looking around some more, hoping against hope I might find someone still breathing here. I found him in the busted form of Hal Blake. His back had been broken like a twig, his eyes bulging from the excruciating pain, and blood was pouring out of him from places it shouldn't. His gun, clearly empty, lay nearby, and it looked like he was fiddling with that same cigar with his good one ha with his one good hand. The other was obviously paralysed, along with most of his body. He eyed me warily at first, but when he realised who it was, he gave a slight wheezy chuckle that erupted into a spasm of painful coughing. I knelt down next to him and looked at him eye to eye. We both knew he wasn't going to make it. Hey Harvey, back to see if you could score with that sweet frail. Jesus Hal, what the hell happened? As I asked, I took the cigar, lit it for him and stuck it in his mouth. I hated the guy, but this was an awful way to go. He deserved a last smoke at least. He inhaled deeply, coughed some more blood up. I was afraid I was going to lose him before he could tell me what happened. And then he looked at me with something that approached regret. Never been any good, Jenkins. We both know that. But you gotta know I tried. I tried to fight those lummoxes off. I nodded, wanting him to continue. Divine hired me as specific to watch after her. Said he had a particular caring for her and wanted to make sure she had, he, he had eyes on her all the time. All I had to do was report back to him about anything that happened or anyone she talked to. He looked away for a moment. I knew that meant me, too. Paycheck's a paycheck, Hal. No hard feelings. He actually meant it, too. He was in enough pain. So tell me how this happened to you. He actually looked back at me with gratitude in his eyes and took another drag of the cigar. After some more coughing, he went on. I could tell I was losing him, though, as he got that ashen, pale look on his face. These giant mooks came busting into the place, screaming something about bearing witness or something. They tore through the flatfoots like there was nothing, and I emptied my piece into the first one in the room. He staggered and fell back, but he didn't fall. He didn't fall, Harvey. He clutched at my jacket, desperation in his eyes. What kind of monster don't fall when you shoot it like that? I couldn't answer him. There were too many in the world like that, to be sure. He started to fade away, eyes closing slowly as he took another deep puff on his cigar. They grabbed the dame. I tried to fight him and grab her back. One picked me up and broke me across his knee like I was kindling. Then you showed up. He smiled slightly. At least I got to go out like a hero for a change. That was the end of Hal Blake. I was thinking of writing a letter to his family when I heard the heavy breathing and the heavier footsteps. We have come to bear witness. Let's see if this medallion does any good. As the witnesses closed in, I scrambled to grab my pistol out of the shoulder holster. Yeah, a dumb move really, since Hal had just died, telling me how little good shooting them would do. My hand brushed up against the medallion Mama Bonte had assisted I keep from my last encounter with these guys. I wasn't real sure how it was going to be any use. I was quickly running out of options. I struggled fully to my feet and put my back against the wall, even as they kept coming. I yanked the medallion out and held it in front of me, displaying it for them to see in the flickering candlelight. Thankfully, it got their attention. They stopped and stared at it, almost like children watching a magic trick being performed. I wasn't sure what to do next, though, and my sudden moment of hope expired as they growled in unison and started forward again. We've come to bear witness. For some strange reason, I thought of my mother. It occurred to me how completely offended she'd be by these guys looking all religious while they did the kind of savage murder that made you think of the Spanish Inquisition. I couldn't honestly tell you why I did what I did next. Maybe it was the memory of my mother made me think of it. Maybe I was divinely inspired. Maybe I was just too desperate to think of anything else. I started reciting the Lord's Prayer. 
our father. They stopped, winced, growled again. The medallion seemed to grow warm. Who art in heaven? They staggered back, almost in unison. Whimpers of pain came from each of them, and their hands moved up to cover their ears. Hallowed be thy name. They started to scream, each one dropping to his knees. Blood began to pour from their mouths, turning their screams into gurgling, choking sounds. I kept intoning the prayer, hoping manically that I wouldn't forget part of it. I didn't. In another few moments, it was beyond certain that they were dead. As I spoke the final amen, the medallion suddenly went up in a fiery flash. I dropped it, but it was ashes floating to the floor by the time I fully let go. Stunned, I stepped over their bodies and made my way outside again. There was Mama Bonte, standing on the front lawn, grinning, a shotgun in her arms. I told you to use the medallion to fight them. She looked me up and down. I got another one for you, and this one's special. Daddy Thunderhand and I made it make a solid charm. He and the others are working a circle to try and protect the city, because it seems Gospel Divine's going to bring very black magic tonight. You best be going, child, or this whole city's going to be a mess. With a deep kiss, she gave me the medallion, which apparently had some kind of oils on it, and they'd also marked it up with a bunch of other symbols. I slipped it over my head, and then she handed me the shotgun and a box of shells. You want a real gun time like this, honey? I pulled up at the gate of the place and immediately knew something was wrong. It might have had something to do with the way the two witnesses were standing right in the way, staring holes through me. It could have had something to do with the way a sudden storm seemed to be rolling right over our heads. It might even have been the strange discordance between what sounded like very strange Bible hymns and a screaming woman. I was fairly certain, however, that it had a lot to do with the way the amulet around my neck was practically buzzing from vibration and glowing straight through my shirt. Even as the bruisers held their hands up to stop me, I hit the gas hard and ran right through them. As strong and tough as they were, they weren't up to a couple of tons of Detroit steel being pushed by a motor that once belonged in a police cruiser. Of course, my car wasn't much up for running through human brick walls either. Fixing that grill was going on my expense report. I leaped out, shotgun in hand. One of the monsters was already getting back up. The medallion seemed to flash a little as I ratcheted around and fired. The witness screamed in agony and fell dead as I blew a hole in him. The hole was bigger than I'd expected, even for a shotgun. Thank you, Daddy Thunderhand. Silently thanking Mama Bonte for having the sense to get a real shotgun and not a breech load double barrel, I ratcheted another round and made for the big tent. The show was in there, whatever it was. As I got closer, I could hear Brother Gospel Divine's voice ringing out over the chants and the songs, and even the screaming. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, the time has come at last. As I promised you, revelation is at hand, judgment day is upon us, and we're the faithful army that the Lord has called to fight for this earth. No, he doesn't sound like that, it would probably be more like, brothers and... No, we're not going to do that though. Here at the heart of sin itself, we will rise up and wash away the stains of greed, sodomy, and unrighteousness with the blood of those who've turned away from God. Can I get a hallelujah? The crowd screamed in unison, hallelujah. Two more witnesses came at me from the side in rapid succession, I put them down. They left me two shots, which I used on two more running around from the other side. I quickly reloaded as I made my way to the side of the tent. I could tell some folks had heard the shots. Mumbles and mutterings started to emanate from the crowd. Brother Divine didn't want to lose his audience, though. See, already the minions of Satan come to dis disrupt our work. Fear not, brothers and sisters, for my witnesses will stand as a wall between them and what we do here. Not so much, Gospel. I muttered as I squatted down, yanked on the spikes holding the tent side down where I was, and rolled up under and into the tent. What I saw before me stopped me in my tracks. There in the centre of the tent, up on a raised platform, Gospel Devino strolled about and addressed the crowd in the bleachers. He was still in his dazzling white suit, gesturing with his cane. Well, it was no longer a cane, turns out it was one of those fancy schmancy cane swords, and he'd drawn the blade out. There were two metal arches with straps, one on each end of the platform. Trussed up on one was Reverend Paul Kellerman. On the other, and the source of all the screaming was his daughter, Rachel. Gospel, why are you doing this to me? She pleaded, tears running down her face. I believed in you, supported you. I delivered my own father to you, knew it. He smiled beatifically. In fact, you did. Lovely Rachel, in fact, you did. As any succubus from hell might in a misguided attempt to curry favour with an angel of the Lord. It's for naught, though, the Lord has always demanded great sacrifices to work his wrath upon the world. And today I stand before my brothers and sisters, his appointed angel, ready to unleash his mighty anger upon this city. Even as he spoke the words and the crowd erupted with great cheers, I found myself dizzied by not one, but two after-images that were playing over him. 
One was a glowing white angelic form with huge broad wings. If that was what the folks were seeing, no wonder he'd them all eating out of the palm of his hand. The other, which was actually a little more pronounced for me as I touched the amulet, was an inky black figure with cold white eyes. It seemed to almost cavort about as he continued pacing the stage, anticipating the carnage to come. It seemed particularly interested in Rachel. Every time it got near the Reverend, who was calmly praying with his eyes closed and had been since I came into the tent, the figure almost seemed to recoil. When it got close to Rachel again, it seemed to grow slightly. That's when I realised what I was seeing. It seemed like it was somehow feeding off of her. With every shriek of horror, it seemed to laugh and grow stronger. This thing was feeding off of her fear. That's when I noticed the swirling shadows up on the top of the tent. Dozens, no hundreds, of inky black creatures swarming up there, hovering as though they were waiting for something. They all looked hungry. My eyes went down to the crowd and the bleachers all caught up in the gospel's mesmerising spell and it finally hit me. He was going to put one of those things in each and every person here. They were all going to become part of his own personal army of demon hosts. Even as I figured this out, a shout came from the stands. Some of the crowd had noticed me, as had some of the witnesses near the exit. So had the dark figure and gospel divine. I was going to have to do something fast before the whole place came down on me. Uh, get the Kellermans out of the things. Without them, surely he's no power. I broke into a dead run before anyone could move, heading straight for the platform. Screams and shouts of anger erupted all around me, but my focus was on the Kellermans. Gospel screamed out, Satan has sent the servant among us! Eternal salvation and glory to anyone who slays this man! Two men jumped at me from the front row of the bleacher I was just passing. I clocked one with the butt of the shotgun, then had to headbutt the other one as he tried to wrap me in his arms. More were coming and I knew it wouldn't be long before they could just pile on me and it would be all over. I pointed the shotgun up in there and pulled the trigger. With a thundering boom, it tore a hole in the top of the tent. That seemed to take the piss and vinegar out of the mob, at least for the moment. But now I had more witnesses bearing down on me. They were all yelling over and over, We shall bear witness! It was more than a little unnerving. Whatever Gospel had been waiting for, it was clear he decided it was time to act. He moved with a purpose over to Rachel, brandishing his cane sword as he did. She started screaming even more intensely, which seemed to really make the shadow thing riding him even happier and larger. I blasted the guts out of the nearest witness in front of me, swerved to the left around the one behind him and shot it in the back of the head as I finally hit the stairs on Rachel's side of the platform. Devino glared at me with pure hate, as at his shadow self, the radiant angel image was still just flapping its wings and looking glorious, seemingly oblivious to the utter chaos going on. Dimly I was aware of cops rushing into the tent from the main entrance as shops were being fired, panic screams grew in volume and people were flowing everywhere like some crazy fruit drink in a mixer. I was guessing the men who hired me had convinced the police to get down here, or perhaps Mama Bonte called them. Either way, they weren't going to be any help to me in the next few moments. Mr Jenkins, you stand in the way of a war that you cannot hope to stop. This world was made ours many years ago, and we will claim it. Still full of charm and power, Gospel's voice had a different tone as he faced me, backing away and edging ever closer to Reverend Kellerman. Men like you are mere annoyances, nothing more. I offered you a chance to join and finally claim the power you've only brushed against. You still can, Harvey Jenkins. You can know power like you've never dreamed of. I just smiled at him. I dreamt about a double shot of Kentucky's Finest, a cold beer chaser and a steak dinner at the Bourbon House. I think that's where I'll go when this is all over. I lowered my shotgun at him. No! He lunged at the Reverend, clearly intended to run the blade through his heart. At that moment, instinct took over and I shifted my aim. The squeeze of the trigger, a massive slug slammed into the juncture where Paul Kellerman's hands were tied, and he went flailing backwards. The whole arch then collapsed, taking him with it to the floor of the tent. Gospel lost his balance and fell after him, but his blade slipped from his hand and clattered to the platform. At the sound of another shriek from Rachel, I turned just in time to see Brother James coming at her with a lo wicked looking curved knife. The gospel will be heard, he shouted as he raised up his hand. I just pointed and fired. Rachel was still screaming, of course. Genteel southern women tend to do that when they're covered in man's guts and blood. I looked back around in time to see gospel running like a madman for the side of the tent. Cops fired round after round at him, but that inky black demon apparently gave him plenty of protection. He ploughed through the canvas and disappeared into the full-blown storm that had erupted outside. Rain poured down in buckets, but I didn't care as I wandered out into the night. There wasn't enough rain in the heavens to wash all the blood out of the last few days, but it was a start. Reverend Paul Kellerman and his daughter Rachel hugged each other fiercely as cops took them to a big nice car. He waved at me and smiled, and even she passed me a grateful look, before burying her face back into his shoulder, the one that wasn't broken. He made me promise to come by and see him in a couple of days. I figured I would, I kind of owed it to him, since I'd been the one who caused his other shoulder to be broken. 
probably also needed to know some of the things I'd discovered about his daughter and her part in all this. I just hoped he wouldn't try to talk me into coming to church. I'd answered a few questions for the cops, but they were going to want a lot more answers in the days to come. Fortunately for me, the mayor's sister was among Gospel's congregation, so he wanted to clean things up as quickly and quietly as possible. Between that and the mayor's gratitude for saving his sister's life, I got a pass tonight and didn't have to go to the station. I was tired, more tired than I think I'd been since Vince Gigante killed me. I opened my car door, tossed the shotgun in the back, and sat down in the driver's seat. Then I reached up to my neck and pulled off the amulet. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but I found myself hoping Mama Bonte and Daddy Thunderhand didn't want it back. After all, Gospel Devino was out there somewhere, and I was pretty certain I'd not seen the last of him. That was the thought for tomorrow. For tonight, it's time to see a rabbi about a bonus. Maybe he'd like to join me for a steak, too. Want to check out the role-playing game of Deadlands Noir? Well, you can go there. And that was a very interesting story, I think. Hope you enjoyed that old-time religion. A Deadlands Noir. Well, graphic adventure, I guess. Graphic novel, maybe. I quite like the story and hope you did too. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.